Welcome to Victory Christian Center. You're about to hear from our senior pastor, Pastor Stefan Schlugel, as he brings a message on a Sunday service. Uh, later on, I want to be speaking about the coming transfer of wealth. Um, and uh, we started last week by speaking about money, and I don't want nobody to get nervous because we're speaking about money, all right? When we talk about money, God doesn't get nervous. Let's not ask get nervous. Let me just do a quick recap, and then we'll uh, get into the uh, body of the message here. But so far, we have talked about, uh, when we're talking about principles, uh, patterns and practices. We use the term principled leadership, I guess just to connect us into the thought of what God is trying to get across to us. Uh, principled leadership means that a person who is leading in any capacity whatsoever, that they're principled in their approach, in their decision making, and in their leading rather than random and flipping around all over the place as sometimes people can do. We talked about ourselves being persons of principles instead of persons of preference. Uh, we also briefly touched on uh, that it's important for us to know uh, when we are talking about politicians, when again come election time, uh, whether that's local elections later on this year or general elections next year, that we know the difference between politicians who are principled in the way that they speak and in the way that they vote or those who are just following the vein of popularity and will flip around whatever suits them in the moment. Uh, so last week we discussed uh, handling money, and we said that when our practices and our patterns concerning money are based on biblical principles, it will lead us into God's prosperity. Um, and uh, I want to just again quickly read that quote here from uh, uh, Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole. He says, you become successful and prosper when you base your life on principles and find the patterns that work for you. The more you build your life on principle, the higher your highs, the straighter your path, and the greater your life. Wow, I think that's awesome. That's absolutely powerful. And so this morning, I want to pick uh, the, the message up here in the book of James, chapter 5. As we said last week, we talked about money, handling money. We talked about employers, employees. We talked about paying bills and so forth. All good practical stuff, I would hope, um, that will help us to base our entire life uh, on principles, including the way that we handle our money. Now, James chapter 5, verse 1 uh, says, It says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you've kept back by fraud, they cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ear of the Lord of Sabbath." Uh, you have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. All right, so quite a, uh, quite a, a, lot, of, a lot of things in those six verses that we've just read here. Um, it lets us know that God has a heart for all people, but God has a heart for the the, the, the workers, uh, the people on the ground. Uh, and let me just say at the outset here, to just make a few comments uh, on this verse, on those few verses before we move on. Principally, God is not against riches or against rich people. Sometimes people skim read over this thing and say, there you go, God's against riches. Well, actually, He's not. And people say, oh, God's against rich people. Well, in principle, He's not. God is speaking here uh, about a certain group of rich people, a certain kind, a certain type, if you like, not because they're rich, beca but because they failed in their stewardship of God's resources. All right? These people here, these rich people, they were not Christians, but they were ruthless merchants and ruthless landowners who made profits by oppressing and def defrauding poor people, oppressing and defrauding their workers. And God says the, the, the very cry of the reapers that have reaped for you in your fields, and then you didn't pay them, you defrauded them, their very cry has come up before me. 
God says, the, the, the wages of the laborers that have mulled your field, he says, you've kept back by fraud. So again, it's speaking about a specific group, uh, a, sp a specific type of rich person rather than all rich people uh, together because, you know, we need to realize this. Uh, and it needs to be said that sometimes people think, oh, I don't know how that person got rich. He must have done something wrong. Well, well, that's, that's not a good saying. Uh, you know, there is a way to get wealthy by employing God's principles and being fair and just in our dealings. And that's the right way to go about it uh, rather than to rip people off and to get to the top, so to speak, by trading on everybody else and trampling everybody else down. So, but what I would like to pick out here is a part here in verse 3, in the latter part of verse 3, where it says, you have heaped up treasures in the last days. Um, and uh, the King James Version says, you have heaped up treasure together for the last days. All right, in the last days and for the last days. How many of you know that we're in the last days? And the last days here is reference to the days before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're definitely in those days. And so this is speaking about now, if I can say that. And uh, again, in verse 1, it's interesting. It says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that, that, are, that are coming upon you. That's yet future. That are coming upon you. You know, we need to make sure that we pick up the tenses of when the Bible speaks. Is this past, is this present, or is this future? And this is speak, speaking about a future day when misery is coming upon rich people who have defrauded their workers, who have ripped other people off, and uh, that's what this is speaking about. All right? You've heaped treasure together for the last days. Um, and of course, nowadays, uh, you know, many of the rich people, we hear their names because they're on the rich list, you know, Forbes rich list, and some of them are just obscenely rich. Um, and, uh, and of course, then we got rich individuals, we got rich families, uh, and, you know, we could, we could mention some of the banking families that are just obscenely rich. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and many of them got there by ripping people off through high interest and through just, you know, just, you know, just creating a system that works for them that doesn't work for the average man in the street. Um, so we are living in the last days before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible prophesies a transfer of wealth in the last days from the hands of ungodly people into the hands of of godly people. Now I'm reminded now, I was looking back, it's been, um, it's been eight, seven, eight years that I, we have taught on this subject the last time, and of course we covered it extensive, extensively in our Bible college. Bible college students will remember this. We talked about the transfer of wealth, and I think now is the time to pick this message up again. I want to do so for, for you know, for, for, so our faith level can rise in this whole area, and our expectation can rise because God wants to do something very significant and very, very powerful. All right, and this is, I need to be reminded all over again, you know, like we know certain truths, and they kind of sit there, but we need to be current in those truths. And uh, so today, I just want to open the subject. This coming Sunday, we'll have guest ministry, and then who knows, we'll pick it up at a later stage and get into greater detail. But for now, let me read from Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22, and, and build a case from the Word of God that something is coming, and it'll be misery for rich people who have ripped everybody else off. And it'll be bliss for those who have been faithful before God, who have operated in their finances according to God's principles, and who have given and sacrificed and helped the poor and, and, and done the right thing. It says, the wealth of the winner, uh, let me start again, the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. All right? The wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. If you're born again, you're one of them righteous ones. You need to realize that. All right? If you're born again, as a, I need to always repeat, you know, we have not committed righteousness. We're not that wonderful. We have been made righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. And now we seek to live a righteous life. But it didn't start with us. It started with God. You know, when He sent Jesus to die on the cross, that the innocent died for the guilty so that we could be made righteous. Is it 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21? That God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be made sin for us, that we 
might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. And God has a wealth laid up. Um, and, uh, you know, the ungodly uh, people gather wealth together for themselves. But God says it is stored up for those who are righteous before Him. And there is a time coming and we believe we're already seeing, having already seen parts of it. And, and let me say, we haven't got the time to get into it, but in the Old Testament, there's been numerous instances where there was a transfer of wealth of this type from the hand of wicked people into the hands of the just. More notably, when uh, the Israelites left Egypt, uh, God told them, He says, before you finally move out and go out in the wilderness to worship me, you know, move on into the promised land, Every one of you, go to your neighbor and knock on their door and ask them to give you all the silver and all the gold and all the special clothing. All right? That's exactly what they did. And for those of you that want a reference for that, let me just swing over to that. That's Exodus chapter 3, verse 22. It's not in your outline, but here it is. But every woman shall ask her neighbor, namely, of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, and thus you shall plunder the Egyptians. All right, so it's been done before. Okay, and God wants to do it again. Hallelujah. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 26, it says, To the man who pleases God, God gives him wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. Does your life please God? Because God wants, wants the, the something to be handed over to you. You know, somebody said once, uh, it's not just all about us. You know, we, we are blessed, but we need to be a blessing to others. And God wants money to come into His kingdom that is needed to fund the end-time harvest of souls. This is quite out there, really. I tell you, this is like a message that, that, that's out there. And in fact, uh, some years ago, I thought, gosh, you know, uh, I said, is this really what's going to happen? I need to go back to the Word. And so anyway, I restudied this whole thing, and I was sort of slightly like, oh, um, oh gosh, can this really happen? This is just, a, just an out there kind of a thought, an out there kind of a concept. And I restudied, and I came away. I said, I'm absolutely convinced. I've been in the Word. I've seen it in the Word. And once I've seen it in the Word, once I've had the revelation, I'm now, I'm now looking, I'm now expecting it, okay? <laughs> and I believe we are in those days, all right? Watch this space. There's coming a time when ungodly people will hand over their wealth to God's people. I don't know how it's going to happen exactly. I don't know all the ins and outs. I just know that it's going to happen because we see it in the Word. Everything that is written in the Word will come to pass. All right? In the meantime, these people are working hard to gather and to store the wealth which, God's need, which God needs in His kingdom. All right, they're just busy out there. They're running. They're running around. They're just, you know, as I say, you know, some of them are ripping people off and everything. They're gathering together. But here's the deal. And we learned this many years ago. People say, oh, you know, we don't want to have anything to do with that money. But here's the deal. You see, money takes on the character of the person who owns it. And when wicked people hold money, it's wicked money. But when it transfers to us, it becomes righteous money. All right? <laughs> And we use it for righteous purposes. Uh, so they're very busy. They're running around right now. And uh, <laughs> of course, Vanessa and I, when we were in Bible college, young and excited and enthusiastic, and we're still young now. We're still excited and we're still enthusiastic. You know, we would drive down to Bible college and we would confess uh, uh, every day. We confess Deuteronomy chapter 28 on the way down with all the blessings. The first 13 verses just really go hard out. We walk around. We see all of these people running around and we say to each other, they don't know this, but they're all working for us. They're, they're all working for us. 
they're all busy and they're all running, gathering things together. And the day is coming when all of that is coming into our hands. And God wants this money used for righteous purposes. God needs this money used uh, for the building of God's kingdom. You know, it's been interesting when you watch uh, uh, when the Israelites plundered the Egyptians and they got all the gold and all the silver, all the articles of jewelry, the clothing they put it on their own kids. Boy, this People came out dressed well. I tell you what, uh, you know, there were slaves in Egypt, but men, when they came out, they came out with silver and with gold, the Bible tells us. And there was not even one feeble person amongst all their tribes. They were all blessed. They were all healed. And that's what God wants for each and every one of us in these days. But, you know, it's been said when they came out with all of that money and all of that stuff, there's no shops out there in the wilderness. You know, they couldn't spend it. Uh, and then when God called for the building of the tabernacle, the people came and they brought gold and silver and precious stones and precious materials and all these wonderful things to build a fantastic uh, place of worship out there in the wilderness. And then, of course, when they moved on into the promised land, God gave him all the lands and, and, and all of the cities as well. So God's amazing. You know, God is, an, is amazing. God needs this wealth in his kingdom to fund the end-time harvest of souls. They're yet missionaries to be raised up and thrust out into the mission field. And they don't have to live out there like paupers. We want to be able to support them better. Um, and uh, there's still, you know, church buildings to be built. Uh, and there's still buildings that need to be, need to be had so that we can g gather together as, as a people, not in terms of the numbers that we're now, but the numbers that we're going to be when we will see the end time harvest of souls when there will be not tens, not hundreds, not thousands, but hundreds of thousands. And around the world, millions and millions of people are going to get saved. Book of Job chapter, Job chapter 27 verse 13. It says, this is the portion of a wicked man with God and the heritage of oppressors received by the Almighty. So God's given a task to these people. <laughs> it says the heritage of the oppressor. Who is the oppressor? The one who oppresses other people and gets rich on oppressing and defrauding other people. He says, though he heap up silver like dust and piles up clothing like clay, he may pile it up, but the just will wear it and the innocent will divide the silver. <laughs> you know, wicked people who make lots of money by pressing their suppliers and their employees are piling up wealth for people who are innocent and just before the Lord. The day will come, as it says here, that the just will wear it and the innocent will divide the silver. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't need to know. That's totally in God's hands. I'm just expecting it to happen. All right, I just my expectation level is getting higher because uh, I, I think I think I think we're entering into those days now. Proverbs twenty-eight verse eight: One who increases his possessions by usury and by extortion gathers it for him who will pity the poor. Are you one of those people that are pitying the poor? that we're helping the poor. So this is one of the reasons why we, why we you know, run a cap center to help people that are struggling financially. We can't help everybody, but we're helping a lot of people. This is why we as a local church, we're looking after 45 to 50 people uh, in our safe house there in the north of Bangladesh. We're looking after all of their needs concerning housing, all of their needs concerning their food, their clothing, their medical needs. We're educating the children. We're doing all of that out of this house. And talk about poor people. These are people off the street. That's why we, that's why we do that, because we want to help the poor. That God wants to help us to help more poor people. Poor people have increased in the last couple of years. And wealth has been consolidated upwards. And uh, people say, oh, wasn't that COVID a terrible thing? No, it's not the COVID. It's the mandates that has decimated the nation. Rob people of their livelihoods, decimated businesses, and the whole thing was just based on faulty science. The tragically scientific reports that the government paid for 
to get what they wanted to hear so that they could lord it over the nation. I didn't plan to get into this, but friends, we need to call, we need to call these things out. You know, some of us went to the protest yesterday because we are a nation in crisis. We don't want to become another Venezuela and we do not want to be another Sri Lanka. Time for a change. The one who increases his possessions by usury and extortion. You see, those who oppress the poor by charging excessive interest. Extortion of prices and high rents and who rip off the workers are gathering possessions for those who pity the poor. I can see a day coming where social welfare will not be run by the state so people don't bow down to that idol called the state. But social welfare will be run out of local churches where people will come and they will bow down before the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, thank you, Lord, for helping me. And thank you for God's people who have helped me. So how can we prepare for that? How can we prepare ourselves for those days? And of course, part of what we've already said in the last few messages uh, is sort of part of that journey towards that. Um, but I think a good place to start will be to look at our attitude. What is my attitude towards money? What is my attitude towards this whole concept of, that we're opening up here today? If you hear these teachings for the very first time, it, you could be like me. Like I struggled when I heard that. I was like, gosh, this, this can't be true. And so I need to have another look. I need to search the scriptures for myself. I need to see it in the Word for myself. It's one thing for somebody else to say, but I need to see it in the Word for myself. But this is the deal. Once we see it in the Word, we know it's true. All right? It's not just fiction. So what is my attitude towards this whole deal? First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, it says, The love of money causes all kinds of evil. Some people have left the faith because they wanted to get more money, but they have caused themselves much sorrow. You know, there's many, many principles that are written in the Word of God concerning money, uh, concerning handling money. The uh, Bible says don't desire to be rich. We're not, we don't want to desire to be rich. We just want to be ready for God to do what He wants to do, to strip the wealth from the globalists and from the upper echelon, many of who have ripped people off. You know, there's whole family dynasties that for generation after generation after generation have ripped people off, generations of it. We could name some of the banking families, the Rothschilds. We could mention the Rockefellers. We've got modern-day creatures like that Bill Gates, who is the biggest owner of, uh, of uh, farming land in the U.S. today buying up farms because farmers are struggling um, and, you know, taking advantage of all of that. You watch these families and you watch these people. Rich, uh, rich, you rich, you weep and howl. The day's coming when they will be weeping and howling because that's what the word says. I don't hate these people. This is not about whether we hate anybody. We just know what's in the word. People have sometimes said that money is the root of all evil. So let's have nothing to do with it. <laughs> and then they go out 40 hours a week, 50 hours, 60 hours, and they work for what? For money. All right? It's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money. In fact, specifically, the King James Version uses that phrase um, uh, that the love of money is the root of all evil. Here in the New Century Version, it says the love of money causes all kinds of evil. So the message is do not love money. You know, money is not a person, uh, though it has a personality to it, depending on who handles the money. Uh, money is a tool. It's not a master. It makes a wonderful servant, but it makes a terrible master. All right, so money is to be our servant. Money is a tool, it's not a destiny. People sometimes, they make money their destiny. I just want to have lots of money. And the Bible says that people that think like that and that act like that, they will piss themselves with many, many sorrows. There will be trouble. 
all right, because that's the wrong way to go about it. So what is our attitude towards money? Sometimes people, sometimes Christians, sadly, they have fought into a poverty gospel and uh, rejected the prosperity gospel. Now, we know that there's extremes in all of those areas. But when I look into the Word of God, uh, I see that poverty is actually part of the curse that's talked about in the Old Testament. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, it speaks about a poverty being like the curse, part of the curse. And prosperity for us, for God's people, is part of the blessing. But God's trying to work with these people to bring them along. And some people say, oh, we don't want that. We don't want to get too rich. We don't want, we don't want to be rich and everything. Well, just reconsider. Reconsider. All right? Look at your attitude. God is trying to deal with our attitude. In uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse uh, 17, it says, Jesus began his ministry saying to all the people, change your attitude and your actions because an invasion of the Spirit is imminent. Now, many people don't recognize those words here because they're out of a, 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 a translation of the New Testament that's not that well known. Uh, it's Ben Campbell Johnson is the man who translated the New Testament. You know, most versions say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But what does repent mean? Most people today don't know what that means. So Ben Campbell Johnson, he calls it, change your attitudes and your actions because an invasion of the Spirit is imminent. We've got another invasion coming. All right? We've got an invasion of prosperity that's coming. <laughs> Praise God. We need to change our attitude in our actions. When I first looked at this, I was amazed that when Jesus first began to preach, he just getting ready now to start his earthly ministry, which lasted some three, three and a half years. The very first thing that he said, the very first thing he talks about is people's attitude. You think about that. He confronted people in their attitudes um, and spoke to them about their actions. In Matthew 3, verse 8, same uh, version here, he says, if you intend to participate in the imminent spiritual invasion, demonstrate a change in your attitude and in your actions. So a change in our attitudes will actually bring forth a change in our actions. You know, it's been said that our attitudes are the invisible drivers of the visible actions in our lives. We look at somebody, they do something, say, why are they doing that? It's because of an attitude. That an attitude has led them towards acting in a certain way. You see, our external actions are governed by internal attitudes. Actions we see, but attitudes we don't. Mind you, if you look carefully, you know, you see people's attitudes sometimes on their face. <laughs> okay. And uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23, it says, And be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental attitude, uh, uh, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. You know, I don't know if that happens to you, but sometimes it happens to me. Sometimes my attitude goes off. You know, I think I'm doing all right, and next minute I know I'm not doing all right. It's just, it's not, it's not good. Like, I've got these thoughts. I've got this, I got this attitude. Like, mm, you know, I get, I get ticked off. I get annoyed. I, and and uh, by the looks of some of you, it never happens to you. You've got that holy look on your face right now. Uh, but it happens to me. This is confession time. Is it okay for me to confess before uh, these very people? And sometimes my attitude goes off. And then when I go before God and I get into the Word, and it just, it just pulls me right up again. It's like, oh, 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 oh. Let, let's get this right, and let's get that right. Let's deal with that. Let's, let's get that attitude out, and, and let's, let's have a, a, a right attitude here, because right attitudes will lead to right actions, which lead to right results. I can't have the results that God promises if my actions aren't right because my attitudes are all off. All right? So it's all connected together. So anyway, uh, we are very uh, shortly running out of time here, but I uh, just wanted to encourage you here today. Um, participation in the transfer of wealth, I believe, depends entirely on our attitudes. And the biggest shift required in our attitude, in our actions, needs to happen in two areas. Number one, 
all the money belongs to God. All the money belongs to God. God says, all the silver and all the gold is mine. Cattle on a thousand hills belong to the Lord. You and I be only the stewards. Because when we have that revelation, bringing our tithe into the house is just, it's just what we do. We started, it became, an, it became an, 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 uh, uh, a practice, but it's now a pattern. <laughs> I remember, I close with this thought, but many years ago there was this person that we had associated with in a particular group uh, of ministers and leaders, and they came with this wonderful revelation, so-called, uh, written down that, you know, tithing is not for today. And a friend of mine, he was very quick to say, look, he said, it's too late. You can't bring that now. It's, it's, you can't talk us out of it. He says, we see it in the Word. Our fathers that have brought us up in the Lord, they've taught us. And we've followed their patterns, and it's now a pattern in our life. You can't talk us out of it. We will not be talked out of the blessing of tithing. Some people see it as a law, but we see it as a blessing, you see. And uh, so all the money belongs to God, and then we just put it wherever He wants us to put it. We only manage us in, of God's wealth. And so God needs His people who will put their hand up and say, Yes, Lord, you can use me to be a channel of that money to come into God's kingdom. And God will give it to those whom He can trust. He will not put it into another group of, of people uh, that uh, will again just absorb it all on their own selves rather than to be a blessing to others and a blessing in God's kingdom. Thanks for watching Victory Christian Center. For more content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Or you can subscribe to our podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, or Google Podcasts. Check out our website at victory.net.nz. We'll see you again soon.